We have 150 members of this body. We have 63 members in the New York State Senate. All of us were elected to serve the variety of constituents in each and every Assembly and Senate district. We are here to serve the people in a capacity outlined in the Constitution of the State of New York. Last year, I opened this session and talked about empowering rank-and-file legislators. A year later, it's not just rank-and-file members whose power has been undermined, it's our entire legislative body. The governor has grown too comfortable in keeping legislators and the public out of the process. Our voice matters. Our role matters. Our place in state government matters. And no one knows the, con the needs of our constituents better than we do. We are the people who live in these districts. We are the people who went to school and grew up and worked in these districts. We are the people who work on behalf of neighbors, friends, parents, families. We live it every day. And that is the reason why we are equal partners in government and should not settle for anything less. <clears throat> also, all the conferences in both houses, we represent over 19 million people. Every conference should be represented in any deliberations about major public policy, including the budget. Billions of taxpayer dollars are at the decision table every year. I think now we're at $145, $147 billion. And I've been here for 16 years, and I still can't believe and some, at how much and surprised I am and appalled at the secretive budgetary process that has been established in Albany. We have elected leaders, that's true. But we have elected five leaders in state government, not just two. And we can count. If we can go into a budget deliberation or major policy discussion and you're outvoted on those policies and going forward, that's okay. That's democracy. And I know each of our conferences in this House, we meet together, we come up and support various public policy positions, and then we should be able to go forth and have those uh, part of those discussions and deliberations. I fully understand numbers. We all can count. But that doesn't mean we should be diminishing the voices of the people, the millions of people, that the minorities in both houses <coughs> should have the opportunity to join in those discussions and deliberations. So again, I call on the governor because he controls these meetings on major public policy discussions and the budget to invite each legislative leader of both houses so that we can provide our ideas and input uh, on anything that's going to affect our constituents, not only as our individual districts, but the collective state as a whole. A couple of uh, public policy highlights I'd like to talk about, not in great length, but some specific things that I think we should uh, talk about this year. I think it's time all regions in our state have access to ride-sharing services. The program is working wonderfully in New York City, and I can't believe that something that's working pretty well in New York City can't be adopted for the rest of the state and do it this year. In terms of budget priorities, or one of the budget priorities that's being talked about and we support, is obviously we all know the minimum wage has gone up. We all know that the Wage Labor Board has increased the wages for uh, fast food workers. Regardless where you are on those issues, now some of the most dedicated workers in our state that are helping the most vulnerable are at stake at not having adequate resources to pay their workers. And that's why we have to help the direct care worker in our state so that they too can have a cost of living salary to be able to 
uh, spend on their families and raise their families, but also at the same time recognize the importance of their work in making a difference in people's lives. I say this all the time with folks that don't have the good health or have been at a disadvantage, whether it's a physical disability or mental disability, why would we not help encourage people to join God's work in helping people at risk? And part of that is you have to be able to have a competitive salary uh, for them to want to take on a very, very tough job every single day. And I applaud the direct care workers, and I think we need to increase the funding so that they can have a competitive um, income opportunity and also hopefully to attract more dedicated professionals to that field. I'm going to mention a specific piece of legislation because I have done this uh, since I've been leader. And I'm hoping that after it's passed overwhelmingly with bipartisan support in the state Senate, that this year we will pass Brittany's law. And for those that are not familiar with this law or proposed law, especially for our newer members, is that this is a piece of legislation that will provide a registry for violent, violent felony offenders to all of our communities. So the families, two people were murdered as a result of not knowing this person was a violent, previous prior violent felon. And this is something that does not really cost anything but may help prevent a tragedy that occurred in this state. We talked earlier about the indigent legal services. Mr. Speaker, I agree with you. This is a classic case that we always talk about in terms of unfunded mandates. It's something where the state comes along and says to the localities, you must do this, but we're not going to help you pay for it. And there's a variety of those different programs. If you go and look at the county budgets, <clears throat> even if you just focused on upstate New York, 65 to 70 percent of the cost of or the money they have to raise from the property taxpayers are based on programs that the state legislature and the governor has said you must do. But we're not going to give you any money to do it. So the legislation that we passed, this body and the Senate, should be a priority. There's many things that we do as a, as a legislature that isn't quote unquote included in the budget process. There's money that is spent outside the budget process every single day. That, again, I believe is an example of when we talk about unfunded mandates, we're saying if we're going to tell localities to do something, school districts, you know, even lead testing with school districts, very important health issue, absolutely. But now we've told the local property taxpayers, you've got to pay for it. Well, if it's that important, I think the state government should provide an opportunity that all taxpayers share in the burden of those things that we're trying to protect all of our communities across the state. Mr. Speaker also talked about business, small business. I totally agree. They've been left out of the discussion. Small business is the backbone of our employers in this state. We have to be creative to, to deal with burdening re uh, regulations over-aggressive state agencies, bureaucracy. Uh, just talk to small businesses in each and every one of your districts, and I'm sure you're going to find lots of stories where these stories are horror stories and not goodwill stories. We have to continue to provide pressure on the executive chamber to have all of the state agencies think about constituent service, customer service first and foremost. How can we help the taxpayer? How can we help the person that's trying to navigate uh, why they haven't got their rebate? And that's, uh, you know, again, it's more the focus of we should be here to help people, not provide obstacles uh, to those people as well. And when we talk about economic development, we do believe that we should analyze all of our economic development programs. I think it is time to do a sanity check, if you will, to see if all of us, as taxpayers, are getting a return on our investment on the variety of different programs that have been put out there through state government. And I think it's just really an easy question. With all the money that's being spent, is it being spent well? Are we getting jobs created? What is the net result of the programs? If we're doing advertising, well, okay, we're going to spend $50 million in advertising. 
did we get 100 million or 200 million or 300 million in return in new business and new jobs? Legitimate question to ask. I think that should be a priority as well as the session unfolds. Rounding uh, this out, and there's obviously many issues I could talk about from our conference's perspective. But I think we do have two significant groups of issues that affect families all across the state. Poverty is one. We have to provide opportunities for people to get out of poverty, to not have to depend on government assistance. And I'm just saying, if, we, if people need our help, we should be there to help them. Absolutely. But we also have to make a more dedicated effort to provide economic opportunities, employment uh, across the state. Our urban areas are in trouble. You talk to any of the representatives that represent any of the cities in our state, poverty, crime, huge issues. We got to give the people across the state hope that there is another light at the end of the tunnel, a positive light, and not just a stream of government assistance. And the last thing I'm going to close on is because of talking to a variety of different people, listening to horror stories across the state. Last year I talked about it as being a priority of our conference in terms of dealing with the opiate problem. Now hundreds if not thousands of deaths across every district, every economic spectrum. We have some severe uh, mental health issues to address with the people that need our help the most. Drug and alcohol addictions are killing our state residents. Our families are suffering as a result of unexplained deaths due to overdose or due to just total giving up on life. That is a crucial humanistic problem that we have to, as a legislature, see what we could do to help stem the tide. What are the root causes? What can we do to eliminate the causes of addiction? Is it more mental health professionals? I'm not sure, and I won't pretend today to tell you all the answers, but I do believe is one of the top priorities to protect our families and their health and their futures in this state. So Mr. Speaker, as always, our conference is always willing to work across the aisle. But as I've always said, our conference's responsibility is to speak up and advocate for policies we believe in that might be better ideas, that might challenge some of the pieces of legislation or modify it, and we will continue to do that in a professional way. And so with all that, I want to congratulate each and every member for your election or re-election. And I look forward to working with each and every one of you and all the good people that work with us in the state of New York. Thank you very much.